Good evening, everyone. It's another Sunday Night Thrive, and you're here, and I'm here, and how totally great is that? I'm really, really glad that we get this time together, and I want to thank you again for just joining me, because uh, it's so much better, even virtually, with company. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's just jump right in, because all kinds of good stuff is to happen tonight, and we've got some deep, deep, deep stuff to jump into. So pray with me, would you please? Lord, we give you this time. We thank you for the privilege of being able to assemble, even if it is, God, through screens. But Lord, I pray that this would be so meaningful and it would be right and righteous, God, and that it would be so spirit-led. And in every way, God, you would lead us now. And Lord, that we would find ourselves exactly where we need to be with you, God. So Lord, tonight, do the cleansing you wish to do in each of our lives, Lord, and let this time be time perfectly spent, we pray. May your Holy Spirit lead us in all points, Lord. In Jesus, in your name, amen. Jesus, how lonely is your name. How lonely is your name You delight me You delight me Yeah You delight me Oh such a great and wonderful God and I pray tonight that we could be so blessed with this time have your perfect work we pray in Jesus name Amen grab your Bibles
I would say tonight as I would any night, please never just believe me. Never just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible have the final say. Or as we would say, don't take my word for it. That's it. And uh, pouring myself some lovely oolong tea. Because that's always part of the. Uh, it's kind of like Mr. Rogers had his shoes. I get, I, you know, I get my tea. And if we're just going to be honest, I think I made out on the deal. If we're going to be honest. All right. Chapter eight. First of all, our first five chapters of Leviticus, I remind you, basic five basic sacrifices, burnt grain, peace, sin, and trespass offerings. And they're given with the perspective of this is how the people are supposed to handle it. Uh, and then the next uh, two chapters, in essence, are really kind of the priest side of it, what he gets, how he gets fed through these sacrifices, his responsibility to them. And in the simplest sense, it's the priest who does the sacrificing that does the work for the people, he's the one who gets fed. So if there's just some slacker, lazy priest out there who that's letting everyone else do it, well, the boy ain't eating. That's the idea of it. And now the narrative begins, and it begins with prepping the priests. It's important to recognize we can embrace the concept of being a priest ourselves as Christians. If you haven't accepted the gift of Jesus, I'm going to give you that opportunity, God willing, uh, before we're done here. But if you've accepted the gift of Jesus Christ, it's important to recognize that back in Exodus 19, God spoke to the nation Israel and said, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, and then in Isaiah 61, 6, we read that you shall be named the priests of the Lord. But then when we look at Peter speaking to Christians, to those set apart unto him, he says in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, and we see that same thing in declaration of, by the way, of all na uh, all tongues and tribes and nations and peoples. When we get to the Book of Revelation, and we see even in Revelation one six, where it says, "And He's made us kings and priests to His God and Father; to Him be the glory and dominion forever and ever." Amen. And we'll see that resurrected, if you will, or revisited in Revelation five ten. So here we are as priests, and. It's important to recognize the idea of God calling us to ministry. And whatever that ministry be, one thing's for sure, it is to affect people. It is to represent God to people and to affect people in the name of the Lord. Uh, and it's important that as a pastor, or I might say as a passionary, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we read that God gave himself some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. In verse 12 it says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's important to recognize that part of my ministry is to equip you for whatever it is God has called you to. And we're going to see beautiful, deep and profound things in this chapter, even though it's primarily revisiting, in essence, being brought to pass what God told Moses to do back in Exodus chapter 29, when he says, this is what you're to do with your brother and the priesthood that's to be done. Interestingly enough, before this great blow it with his brother in uh, with the golden cap, it's important to note that because God already had a calling upon Aaron before all of that. Aaron's going to blow it hard, as we know. One of the things actually that we kind of remember the most about him is the sort of the golden calf incident. And God is still going to bring that to pass on the other side of it. And the reason I say that is that the gifts and callings God has placed in your life are irrevocable. He does not take them back. Because when he offers them to you, when he chooses you for whatever that ministry is that he's called, that is bespoke to you, it is with the mindset already of knowing the things that we're going to discover about ourselves and even stupid choices we will make after that. Uh, it is well, God is well aware of all of those things. Now, that is never a reason to be a numpty uh, about our walk with Christ, but rather to celebrate the fact that God already had a plan for it. Just the same way that God had, had a plan for Peter before Peter denying Jesus, that he even knew him thrice. All right. And it's important to know, maybe that's a message someone needs to hear. Well, I'm sure that is. Someone needs to hear it tonight. That maybe you've come to grips or come face to face with a very ugly part of you. And God's like, I already knew all of that. You're discovering it. God's like, but I'm not. But I still have a calling on your life. 
Isn't that, isn't that just encouraging? All right, Leviticus 8, 1. Let's read the first few verses. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, verse 2, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments and the anointing oil, the bull as the sin offering, two rams and a basket of unleavened bread, and gather all the congregation together at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, verse 4. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the congregation was gathered together at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now, in one iteration or another, we will see eight times, which, by the way, is a number for new beginnings, eight times something along the lines of Moses did as the Lord commanded him, as the Lord commanded me, or as the Lord is commanding me to do, or they did this just like the Lord commanded. And we see that introduced here as the first of those eight times. This, by the way, this get these things and bring these things. In other words, here's your, here's your shopping list uh, to prepare for this great event. We see this. Uh, again, God preparing us for this in Exodus 29, the first three verses. Verse 5. Mm, it's a good tea. Moses said to the congregation, this is what the Lord commanded to be done. Here's our second of those statements. Now, I really like this because Moses, we know we, God said that Moses tell the people this, but if I were Moses, I would do verse 5. And that is, he's about to do some funky things with his brother uh, in front of everybody. Remember, the congregation is gathered, and whether that be just the elders as representation, or whether that be a couple million people gathered together around the tent, uh, around this tent that's been constructed at the end of Exodus, beginning of Leviticus now, uh, God is, and I don't want to outrule anything because God is able to do things supernaturally. He could make this as if they were all in SoFi Stadium and he could have jumbotrons, holy jumbotrons on, on clouds. We don't know. All we know is somehow the whole congregation is, be it out of representation and proxy or out of total proximity, they're all gathered. And Moses turns to everyone and goes, I just want you to know what I'm about to do. God told me to do it. And I do like this. It sets an example to everyone that when God challenges you to do something unusual or hard, that you do it anyways. And it predisposes me to look deeper for we realize that this is God telling me to do this. It predisposes me to look deeper into the event with the transcending eyes that God is really speaking to say something because he's a very intentional and pragmatic God. So here's where it begins, verse 6. Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And you can see what I mean. How awkward would this be? Uh, brother Moses, Uncle Mo grabs the loofah and starts saying to the, all right, you guys, this is what God told me to do. And then he just starts washing his brother and his nephews. Now that's not a, you know, that's not a normal thing. And there's a simple point to it. And we could talk about the water of the word. And I do like, the, I've heard this said, that when we talk about washing of the water, we talk about washing in water that is related to the Word of God. But when we are thirsty and we're drinking in the water, we are drinking in the water, and that water is the living water of God's Holy Spirit. So I love the fact that God runs these always in tandem. He wants to make sure there is this aspect of we are, that the Word of God is, in, that we are encased in the Word of God, but yet, we are, we are refreshed and rejuvenated through the living water of God's Holy Spirit. And even when we talk about be being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, in, ex, in, I'm sorry, in, in uh, Ephesians 5, speaking to one another in psalm hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to God, we have that in Ephesians 5, but then when we get to Colossians, it's sort of like a cliff notes of it, we read, let the word of God dwell in you richly, speaking to one another in psalms and spiritual songs. And I get the idea that God wants to make sure that one should not be without the other. There is the Word of God, that's the anchoring truth. And then there is the Spirit of God, if you will, that's the ignition. And you don't want a car that has an ignition without a steering wheel, but a car is not going to be much good if it has a steering wheel without an ignition. And both of them are in essence, or if you will, an engine. The, the, the Holy Spirit is the engine, and the Word of God is the steering wheel. Well, there you go. All of that said, here's our first basic point, and that is Moses has to wash his brother. Moses has to wash his nephews. And the point is, the testimony to the whole population is, I can't wash myself. 
This is something that God must do, and this is at the commandment of God. It's a great place to start. Verse 7. And he put the tunic on him, girded him with the sash, closed him with the robe, put the ephod on him, and he girded him with the intricately, or if I think the word is, uh, I'm trying to think of the word in the King James because it's a fun word. It's kind of like curiously woven bag of the ephod. And with it tied the ephod on him, he put the breastplate on him, he put the urim and the thummim on in the breastplate, and he put the turban on his head, also on the turban, on the front, there was that Kudushim de Yavech, um, you know, holiness to the Lord. He put the golden plate, that holy crown that says, Holy, I am set apart unto the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there's our phrase again. Here's the second thing. Now Moses has washed them. Now, whether they're in their skivvies or not, I don't want to argue that point. What's because it's not said, but what we do know is Moses is going to clothe them. But of all the things he's putting on them, notice it isn't like he's putting their tidy whities on them. So I'm assuming that they're going to be, they're not just going to be naked for everyone. But Moses is still washing them, and then Moses has to clothe them. And the second point is this I can't clothe myself. That's the testimony to the people. I can't wash myself, I can't clothe myself. God has to do these things. But I can make the choice to put him on. I could put on that new man, Ephesians 2.4. Uh, I'm sorry, 4.24. Or I could put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering, Colossians 3.12. But above all things, in Colossians 3.14, I'm going to put on love. And all of that, it can be encased in one simple statement. And that is from Romans 13.14, where it says, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I can't, I can't wash myself, I can't clothe myself. Verse 10. Also Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and he consecrated them. He sprinkled uh, of it on the altar seven times, anointed the altar seven times, the laver in its base to consecrate them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. And by the way, all of these things are completely in tandem with Exodus 29, where God says, you're going to need to do this, and now he's doing it. We've made our way to verse 7 of Exodus 29 on the list of things to do. Okay? And it's important to recognize, just like I can't wash myself and I can't clothe myself from an eternal spiritual perspective, I also cannot anoint myself. And that is the essential aspect of this. Uh, it is God who does the anointing, just the same way that it is God who does the clothing and God who does the washing. Now, here's the point beyond, as we encapsulate this first part of this, is that though I can't wash myself, though I can't clothe myself, and by the way, I remind you, clothing is your riches and identity. That's important to know. And I can't anoint myself. What empty religion does is he takes that takes these things and places them in my hands and makes me do them the whole idea it seems like the whole world is aware of the fact that they're not right with god and one man or another we're aware that we're guilty filthy stained jaded broken whatever the term is we're aware of the fact that we are not in our best possible shape we are not in a place of complete personal amnesty by our own merit. And in that, the question is, how do we get right? How do I wash myself from all the filth of my past and the stains that I and myself have gathered? And when I look, it still makes me sick to my stomach when I think of the things I've done before Christ. Uh, but then also, how do I embrace a new identity, one that actually is different from the filthy guy that used to be, but then also in that, how do I empower myself to become a person different than the guy I used to be? And, and all of that is the difference between every empty religion out there where you, you make your trips, you do your kind deeds. You, but the problem is if I'm covered in filth, just adding another layer of something isn't going to wash it off. I need this thing buried and removed for good and a whole new thing to raise up. And that's the message of the cross, beloved where Jesus dies for my sins and yours as well, so that all of that filth, all of those crimes and that grime 
can be paid for and punished to the full so that I can be cleansed in the blood of Christ. And as that washes off of me, I can't do that, but he can do that. If, and he's just simply asking for my permission. But then in that, we read that Christ not only died on the cross where his blood was shed, but also that he was buried. And at his burial now, I see this idea that God is removing the old me to put on a whole new me. That new me is not going to be a redecorated old me, but it's going to be a whole new creation for whoever is in Christ is a new creation. But then at the resurrection, there is this whole aspect now of a new me that is empowered by the power of God's Holy Spirit, where now I have been, though once dead in my trespasses and sin, God has raised me up and quickened me, made me alive through the power of God's own Holy Spirit that he's placed within me as a guarantee of this new life and inheritance that I have in him. The old me living under the power of of the enemy and under the dominion and bondage of my sin and the new me, a resurrected, adopted, born again, creation, new creation of God. And that can only happen through the gift of God, not through myself. But the moment we take these three fundamental things and we put them into the hands of men, we will find ourselves taking responsibility for what only God can do. And and now we're doing these things to try to make God do something instead of responding to God's offer to do them for us and through us and to us. And this can be so clearly registered, codified in the book of Ruth, where Ruth, a filthy foreigner working in the field, is noticed by the owner of that field, Boaz. And when he sees her, she's filthy. She's been working all day. She is a Moabite, not an Israelite. There is nothing in and of them culturally, in her culturally, in that culture, that would make him look and go, she's the one I want. She's not dolled up. She's not her best face forward. The girl has just, she's been sweating all day, picking up the gleanings in the field. And yet in that, he wants her anyways. But when she comes home to her Jewish mother-in-law, her husband, by the way, passed away, so there's nothing funky here. Uh, In that, this is mom's advice in Ruth 3.3. She goes, listen, therefore, wash yourself, anoint yourself, and put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. And in the simplest sense, throw yourself down at his feet. Now, what she's trying to tell her daughter-in-law, what the the religious uh, mother-in-law is saying is, This is how you make somebody want you. You wash yourself. You clothe yourself. You anoint yourself. And then, now that you've done all of that, how can he not take you? But we already know from reading the story, he already wants her and he wanted her when she was none of those things, when she wasn't washed, when she wasn't anointed, when she wasn't clothed in something nice, but in her work clothes. There she was in a track suit, you know, just sweating it out. And in that same way, I want you to know God wants you filthy and miserable, but he's not going to leave you that way. This isn't you saying, I'm gonna do me and let God adjust. This is God saying, I will take you as you are, but then I will do the adjusting of you. But you've got to let me. Give me permission to wash you so you no longer live that filthy life. Give me the permission to dress you, to make give you a whole new identity. And then give me the, the, the right, the license to anoint you, to empower you, to walk away from that old life, but to live a new, one, a new one where now we've been set free, but not using that liberty as a license for sin, but rather, but rather to be empowered to serve one another through love, serving one another. Well, with that then, now that we recognize in those first 12 verses, Isn't that just beautiful? God has just made that clear just the same way he has in Exodus 29, verse 7 verses. 
that God's the one to do the work and he's using Moses as, as, a, as his example so that all of the things that are necessary from being a sinner to being saved to being sanctified and then ultimately consecrated and ultimately now to step into their calling and to be empowered for that, all of that for service, all of that is God's work and he uses his own means and whatever means those would be for that to be the case. Uh, verse 13, now we're going to see that in regards to the kids. This is in tandem with Exodus 29, 8 and 9. Moses brought Aaron's sons, put tunics on them, girded them with sashes, put hats on them. And the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses, there's our phrase again. And here's my point as I look at this. I can't do this for my children, but I can bring them to the one who can. Moses had to to be there present, but Aaron had to bring his children himself. And as they were brought and stood before Moses, now God's going to do that work through Moses. And I realized, I want my children consecrated. I want my children set apart. And the best I can do is bring them to the one who does that work. And as I bring them, I trust that God will continue and continue and continue to reach out. And God is so faithful in that. I've watched that with both of our children. Now what's left for the remainder of the chapter are the sacrifices that are done. And we see them as well in intentional order. Verse 14. And he brought the bull for the sin offering. Then Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull of the sin offering, and Moses killed it. Then he took the blood and put some of it on the horns of the altar around with his finger, purified the altar, he poured the blood at the base of the altar, and consecrated it to make atonement for it. Then he took all of the fat that was on the entrails, that should sound familiar, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, and the two kidneys and their fat, and Moses burned them on the altar. But the bull, its hide, its flesh, and its offal, he burned in the fire on the outside of the camp, again, as the Lord had commanded Moses. This is our parallel to Exodus 29, 10 to 14. And now our first sacrifice, and our sacrifice one is, I gotta deal with sin. I gotta recognize that. Even as God is preparing for, for me for ministry, as we see here, I never want to forget that I am a person that still has a desire to do wrong. Paul would say this 22 years into his ministry, 22 years as a Christian, and he would still say, why do I do what I don't want to do? That which I will to do, I don't do. That which I know not to do, that I find myself doing. And, and I get the idea, and, Mo, and Paul would say, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And in all of that, a person that forgets their predisposition and predilection to sin is a person that sets themselves up to sin themselves. And the, again, here they are, they're laying their hands on this animal. This animal's dying on my behalf. I'm openly testifying that I deserve this, but instead it is being done on my behalf. My sin breeds death. And there is no person called in ministry, active in ministry, that should ever, well, none of us should, but even all the more, should ever forget that our sin, be it however private or public, breeds death. And I never want death to be part of the ministry God's called me to. How about you? Verse 18. And then he brought the ram as a burnt offering. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of, of the ram. And Moses killed it. And then he sprinkled the blood all around the altar. He cut the ram into pieces. Moses burned the head, the pieces, and the fat. And he washed the entrails and the legs of the water. And Moses burned the whole ram on the altar. It was a burnt sacrifice for a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And again, now in Exodus 29, 15, 18, so you can, you can take a look at it. But now look at how we go from, and it'll always be in this order there. You deal with sin, and then you hand the surrender. That's the way that we want to recognize when it comes to any sin in our lives that, because that now is brought to our attention, is that I, once I deal with this sin, I want to follow up with surrender. When Jesus says, neither do I condemn you, with dealing with the sin, the woman laid at his feet, then he says, go and sin no more. 
and I get the idea here that our you know propitiation should be dealt with with penitence and repentance and so as a priest in front of everyone I'm a sinner like you and that sin breeds death but I recognize one paying that sin on my behalf and then oh thank you but may I live a life now completely surrendered to the living God and it's now that we bring our third uh, sacrifice which is the second ram because remember there was a bull and then a ram and a ram verse 22 and he brought the second ram the ram of consecration the word in the Hebrew is milu try that milu it's the word that is used for setting a gem we might say the ram of installation for those who've, who's ever been in a position where they have an official installment where you are now being officially installed into that position that's what's taking place here and that's what we have in verse 22 then Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of that notice in each of these cases this cannot happen without the shedding of blood and it's not my blood but it is the blood of my sacrifice my substitute the one who comes in lieu of me that I have a right to even make this claim to be installed in the first place verse 23 Moses killed it as he has the others and he took some of the blood and put it on the tip of Aaron's right ear, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe, or as King James would say, the grand toe of his right foot. And then he brought Aaron's sons, and he did the same thing. Moses put some of the blood on the tips of the right ears, on the thumbs of the right hands, and on the big toes of the right feet. And Moses sprinkled the blood all around the altar. And I do really, really like this, because I recognize that this has to be set apart by the blood. This has to be set apart by the blood. My feet set apart by the blood. And I recognize what I hear, let it be set apart by the blood. What I set my hands to, let it be set apart by the blood. Where I go, let it be set apart by the blood. And, and I love the fact that God wants Aaron and his sons to know who are called now into their calling stepping into their calling being installed into their calling but also for the whole nation to see for God's people to see that if we we're going to step into this calling God has for us that this ear belongs to God now these hands belong to God these feet belong to God so may I hear what you say above anything and everything else May I set these hands to what you call me to uh, above anything else. And may I go where you lead me, be it, where, be it someplace I would volunteer or be it someplace I would rather drag that grand toe. But in either case, they belong to God. So sin, then surrender, and then setting in place. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Well, that's our crime. I deal with the crimes of my heart. And then the concession that's made for that and surrender, I can I concede to God, and then I embrace the calling He put in me. Verse 25. The rest of this now leads us to worship. And doesn't that real honest worship starts with dealing with my sin, leaning to surrender, and then letting God set me where I belong. And that's where worship really explodes. Verse 25. And then he took the fat of the fat tail. All the fat that was on the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, the two kidneys and their fat, lots of fat hair, of course. And you know what that leads us to? That always makes me think of the peace offering and the right thigh. And from the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he took one unleavened cake, a cake of bread anointed with oil, one wafer, put them, in the th uh, put them on the fat and on the right thigh. And with all of these things, in Aaron's hands and in his son's hands, they wave them. They're waving them. Yay! Like this is the, the tradition. Classic Hebrew tradition is the wave is done this way, or sort of right to left, you know, shaking, you know, that kind of thing. And then the heave is done front and forward, like shake it like a Polaroid picture. You get the idea. So, either way. Uh, verse 27 He put all of these in Aaron's hands, Aaron's hands, and in his son's hands, wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. And there's an act of worship. Uh, there's a part of me that, I don't know, this is just my weird mind, that I see them almost like a windsock. You know, where they're just kind of doing this with all of these. They're really, they're waving their dinner. 
for what it's worth, or at least a part of it. Then Moses took them from their hands, burned them on the altar, the burnt offering. They were consecrated offerings for a sweet aroma. It was an offering made by fire to the Lord. Here's the stuff, God, now. Take it. Burn it. It's all yours. I surrender it all. And Moses took the breast and waved it as a wave offering before the Lord. And Moses was more than happy to wave that because that's dinner for him. It was Moses' part of the ram's consecration, again, as the Lord commanded Moses. And we're roughly at about verse 28 in Exodus 29 by this point. And again, once sin has been dealt with, surrender is my part, and I'm being set in place, then comes the worship, the wave, and the heave. <clears throat> Our last verses. And then Moses took some of the anointing oil, some of the blood which was on the altar, sprinkled them on Aaron. Now I want to point out again, as we're going to look at this, that all their garments, that they're, they're gussied up in God's gussied up-ness. So some of the blood that was on the altar, sprinkled it on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him. And he consecrated Aaron and his garments, his sons and the garments of his sons with him. And I do find this important because... Oil just, it just doesn't come out of clothing. And, and when I look at Psalm 133, where it's like, Behold how good and how beneficial or pleasant it is for the brothers to dwell together. And then the, 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 it gives us these two metaphors. The snow that falls on my Hermon that ultimately melts and drips all the way down and then brings water for the people to drink. And the oil that drips just again poured but then drips off Aaron's beard and off the hem of his garments that tells me he was clothed but this when it happened Aaron is Moses didn't just kind of like sneeze oil at Aaron he didn't go ah, you know he just he coated the boy in this stuff and as he did here is Aaron a picture of this in the noonday sun shining and reflecting the light of the sun that gives life to everything and here he is, standing apart from everyone. It would be easy to spot him. He's the guy that is reflecting the light that is bringing life to this whole planet. And in that, people look and go, that, that guy's different. And I want that for me. But I recognize God's like, I want to do that, but we want to deal with your sin. And here's the great thing. Remember, I can't wash myself. God has done it. He's just asking, well, can I have this? And then in that, let's, let's deal with your surrender. And in that surrender, there's a new identity. And there is that clothing as God now says, look at who I am. I, I, want to ref I want you to reflect me now. And in that, here's God clothing. And I'm like, oh, God, yes, I want to surrender completely. And then as I surrender completely, I'm like, oh, Lord, now anoint me. And as you anoint me, Lord, set me in my place and empower me for what you have and you want to do. And God's like, now, watch how I anoint you. And as I anoint you, the world's going to see it. Verse 31. Moses said to Aaron and his sons, now it's time for dinner. Boil the flesh at the door of the tabernacle of meeting and eat it there with the bread that is in the basket of consecration, consecration offerings as I commanded, saying, and there's that, that phrase again, Aaron and his son shall eat it. What remains of the flesh and of the bread, you shall burn with fire. And like the sin in the burnt offering and the wave offering, the burnt offering, it's like there's God as a specific party wants to make sure that all of his priests, <coughs> those stepping into their calling, and God's, God's like, it's my job to provide for you. And here it is. Verse 33. And you shall not go outside the door of the tabernacle of meeting for seven days until the days of your consecration are ended. For seven days he shall consecrate you. As he has done this day, so the Lord has commanded to do to make atonement for you. Therefore, you shall stay at the door of the tabernacle of meeting day and night for seven days and keep the charge of the Lord so that you may not die. Can we agree that's dire consequences? So I have been, I have been commanded. So Aaron... And his sons did all the things that the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses. How does this end? With them washed, with them clothed, with them anointed, and with them fed and sustained. And then here's the, here's the wild thing. In all of that, I'm like, what do I do now? What do I do? What do I do? And God goes, first, just be 
with me. Not, I'm going to give you all this, go off, change the world, and come back and tell me how it goes. God's like, first and foremost, never, never forget, this is about being with me, God speaking. I'm the one who's washed you, God speaking. I'm the one who's clothed you, God speaking. I'm the one who's anointed you, God speaking. I'm the one who set you in your place for your calling. That's my ordination, God speaking. And in all of that, don't get so caught up now in this calling that you forget that this is supposed to be something I do through you and not that you do for me. I never want to get so caught up in the ministry that I actually neglect the one who's called me in the first place. I want to be able to say as Paul did, that that which I first received I offer you. I want to be able to talk about how wonderful it is to walk in intimacy with God. Being in that state when I'm offering it to you and I can confidently tell you that's what I'm doing right now. I'm offering to you this intimate place and so let me ask a couple questions and we'll pray we'll end with a song and dismiss first of all are you in this place where you're trying to pay God back where you're actually or worse you're trying to wash yourself you're trying to clothe yourself you're trying to anoint yourself you're going to be self-empowered and build your identity with your dreams and this is, this is, my, this is my destiny or I'm just trying to make myself better for God. Hey, God's a good fisherman. He catches his fish and then he cleans them. Isn't that good news? What God is asking you to do is to come weary and heavy laden. Let him give you rest. Tonight, let God cleanse you. Even as this word has God gone forth, if you've not accepted the gift of Jesus, know this. There are stains no earthly water can wash off. But the blood of Christ is an eternal cleanser. And that blood was shed for you at the cross so that every stain could be washed away. Will you accept that gift tonight? He's simply waiting for you to say yes. That is death at the cross is to wash you clean. His burial, to bury the old you, his resurrection to empower to give you a new identity one that is set free that is a servant and loves others and that's the offer if you've accepted that gift God now says I want to pull you into your calling let's never forget we're still we're still predisposed to sin so let us always make the careful uh, attention to making sure that that's not something that we allow concessions for and then in that, let us live a life of surrender. And in that surrender, let us let God set us where He wants us to create the best impact on the world around us. And are you letting God do that? Are you still fighting God when God's plan for you is so much better than anything you can come up with? Well, tonight it's time to lay it down, don't you think? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this beautiful text. I thank you, Lord, that in all of this, even to the point of the provision that was given for the food of these priests, that it was something you provided, and I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, for the blessing of being able to serve all of these years, and it's been wild and crazy and so rich, and you've had to provide, and sometimes... It means we never saw, many times it's in means we never saw coming. So tonight, God, I pray for every believer, myself included, that we would never leave any door open to sin, that we would live in a state of surrender, in an openness and a readiness and an availability for you to set us right where you want with your empowering to be used by you. But if there be any who have not accepted the gift of Jesus Christ, 
Oh, let tonight be that night. Lord, now convict their hearts and show them that if they're willing tonight to surrender, to, to give you open license to their life, you are willing to do more than simply be the Lord of it, but to be the complete rebuilder and reinventor. And in that, God, create a new and beautiful thing in these lives. And if that be you, pray this prayer. Let's just pray a prayer of surrender tonight. God in heaven, I confess to you, I'm a sinner, and that sin separates me from you. But that sin was paid for at the cross. And I come with all my filth, with all my grime, and I pray that you would cleanse me by the gift of Jesus at the cross. Just the same way that Aaron lay and his sons laid their hands on this animal to confess their sins upon, uh, this animal that would die, we openly confess our sins before Jesus, knowing he died for them on the cross. He was buried and resurrected just like your Bible promised. And in that same way, bury the old me and raise up a new me that looks like you. Empower me by the power of your Holy Spirit and make me what you want to make me as I hand my life to you now, confessing Jesus as my ransom and as my resurrected Lord. I am yours in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer tonight, I would love to be able to follow up with you, encourage you. It's been asked uh, if there are any who wants to support the ministry, do contact us. We'll leave an a email address and we'll give you the information necessary. Notice we never take a collection or make any plea, but it, it, we do find it necessary at least to let you know you can if you want to. Having said that, <clears throat> we'll sing a song and dismiss and I want to thank you again for the privilege of being able to, uh, to serve you again and thank you for the blessing of being able to do this. Shall I call you for all you done for me? My love, my life, my life, my home, my peace. And what can I offer? In response to all of these He is my life, Lord You me as you please Yeah So let these praises rise Like incense fill the skies My surrender life My greatest act of praise Yeah Covenant keeper Friend and healer Savior, I am yours. Covenant keeper, friend and healer, my redeemer, Jesus, I am yours.
that we can be yours in your name. Amen. God bless you, saints, and might I say, Happy Christmas.